Um, well, you know, I'm, I, um, I'm not, I don't follow Canadian politics that closely, so I, I'm not sure about that. But um, it, again, it's not natural to separate church and state, so it, it is something you have to fight. Um, it's not something I spend a lot of time. I guess maybe the creation or something like that is my thing. But, um, you know, this under God should not be in, in the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, in God we trust should not be in the money. It's absolutely true. It shouldn't be. And it seems like a small thing to bother with, but the arguments that the people like Mike Newdow make, which are reasonable, that if you let that little thing happen, then another, and then another, and pretty soon the wall comes crashing down. And I think that's right. So. It makes us feel like outsiders. Yeah. Uh, look, here's here's another argument I make with with uh, see Christians are all in favor of having more government power. So I say, okay, so let's say you you enact that into law. What if in like say 50 years uh, Christians are the minority and Muslims are the dominant religion in America? Mm -hmm. You, you sure you want to legislate that, that it's now law that the Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> or a fun one is, uh, how about we change the Pledge of Allegiance to, you know, one nation under Allah. They always go, oh, oh, well, no. I say, it's the same guy, you know. <laughs> Yahweh and Allah, it's the same God. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's just what you're used to when you're the dominant religion. And, but, okay, yeah. uh, wait a minute, you already, uh, let's do it. Yeah. Um. You were talking about the, the prob problem of tipping. On the problem of tipping, I was kind of curious when you were talking about that. You're talking about the pleasure centers light up when you do something good and stuff. But when I started thinking about it, for me, yeah, you know, if I'm by myself, strange t town, I tip, and I think, I mean, is there the other side? Is there a section of the brain that gets lit up if you when you feel bad about stuff? Because if I did a, if I tipped like I'm supposed to usually don't even think about it that much. It's like if I didn't do it, I'd walk out going, kind of what a yeah. schmuck. Yeah, 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 right. So. I don't know if there's something the neurologists would call it, you know, the non-pleasure center or right. something like that. I've never seen that. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but certainly, yeah, the guilt center. Yeah, yeah uh, Puritan's got a big one. It's yeah. huge. <laughs> <laughs> do you know Ambr Am Ambrose Beers, or is it H.L. Mencken's little quip about what a, pu a Puritan is somebody who has this haunting fear that somewhere someone out there is happy yeah. Yeah. and having fun yeah. and that's, uh, that pleasure center no, that's got to stop the modern version i heard of that was recently was uh, oh the puritan that heard uh, that f when he first heard about simultaneous orgasms said well two wrongs don't make a right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is cable right so it's yeah. okay <laughs> yeah go ahead in one of Stephen Jay Gould's last book, he came up with the idea of uh, non-overlapping -over domains for uh, yeah. science and religion, basically trying to say, hey, it makes no sense to fight about this. But with uh, your book here, you seem to throw them right back together. <clears throat> yeah, I, um, of course, I knew Steve Gould, and I, I pretty much agree with that non-overlapping magisteria. For the most part, there's no conflict between science and religion. Um, as long as the God of your religion doesn't do anything. Hmm? Think about this, that if God is active in the world, and most believers think he is, or she, or whatever, um, it should be active in some measurable way. And most believers believe that it is, you know, like prayer and healing, some relationship between prayer and people get better, something like that. Okay, then where's the data? And in that case, then there is a potential conflict. And there's, of course, conflict if you if you take things like the Bible literally in terms of like a six-day creation, something like that. Uh, but most of the time, science is just a way of doing something. As I said at the beginning, if, intel if it turned out the intelligent design creations were all right, it wouldn't change any of the science because they're not doing science. It's just sort of a way to think about what are the consequences of the scientific data for your religious beliefs. Then maybe what they're doing has something to do with that, but n not the science. So. In that sense, Gould is right that these are kind of just largely different domains. In, and then what you're getting out of the last one with this book, um, Gould did always say that science has nothing to say about morality. Um, in, in one sense, he means that science can't give you the moral answers. Uh, is abortion moral or immoral? Science cannot answer that because it depends on when you think life begins. And, and by, by, by the scientific worldview, there is no answer to that because it never ended. It's a continuum. But the law requires an unambiguous line that's drawn. That's when it begins. Right there, before that, it's legal. After that, it's illegal. That, it's simply the difference between the way science 
and the law operate. And so there, there you have something of just a difference in the way science and religion thinks, I think. Um, a separate life, <coughs> yeah. as you were saying. Yeah. In other words, we, separate life. Obviously, the woman has a life. Yeah, okay, so like in my book, here's how I, I uh, here's what I say. Um, I mean, I'm pro-choice, uh, and I was before I even thought about writing the book. So, but, and I almost switched over, actually, because uh, the arguments on the other side, some of them are pretty good, and, but then I got to thinking, okay, like in, in Judaism, there's an actual moral precept that you must help somebody who is uh, in, in trouble, who is ill, who, is, who needs help. It, this, is, this is part of being human. You help your fellow humans. And in fact, if you don't, it's a form of immorality. Okay. So given the choice between, uh, let's say, let's go back to the stem cell thing, between uh, helping a fully functioning, rights-bearing person versus a clump of cells, well, okay, maybe the clump of cells is a potential human and potentially a rights-bearing person, but this person has priority over that. You have to make choices. And so science doesn't give us that answer, but at least informs our decisions because it gives us some information about stem cells and people and, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, how about in the back there? Um, you talk a lot tonight about uh, sort of the positive side, you know, with evolution, the pleasure centers and, and things like that. What if you see a, any correlation or a connection between some of the negative sides like punishment and its evolution society and almost the need or the correlation for there being evil? Like, basically, if, if it's a requirement or, or um, an advantage for an individual to be able to punish another individual on an evolutionary scale, then does that also necessitate that they have to have some capacity for the, quote, evil or the, yeah, the I harsh think so. side? I think in a way, you know, that without good, there's no evil. Without evil, there's no good. I mean, there's some contrasting conceptual notions there. But behaviorally, I think they, they, they go hand in hand like that as well. It's what makes morality morality because there's a choice being made, a choice between this, doing the right thing, and that, doing the wrong thing. And, and those behaviors that matter for the group uh, just take, back back to the question of infidelity. What's wrong with that? Well, it completely destroys trust. But why? Why should it do that? Because we are, by nature, s monogamous. Well, serial monogamy. <laughs> anyway, we swap along. Uh, <clears throat> but 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 in that particular monogamous relationship, there's a strong, bonded attachment made, and we know the chemical uh, nature of this it has to do with oxytocin and serotonin. We can track it. Uh, of uh, the, the studies that take blood of people that are newly in love, and you know you get that, you know, fantastic infatuation thing going, and all that stuff, and it's just pumping through your blood. They can they can they can record all that, and uh, and and it's really a strong uh, bond. So uh, an infidelity destroys that bond. People, uh, this is the purpose of jealousy, but it does more than that. It destroys communities. It destroys a family. It destroys the extended family. It destroys the community because of all the relationships and so on. So communities generally uh, uh, condemn infidelities because it's not just, it's not, you know, that I'm sticking my nose in your business. You can sleep with whoever you want. It's really more than that because so many people are affected. So that's, that's why, I, I, again, I think I, I wouldn't personally tell you what you should, who you should or shouldn't sleep with. But, but there is something we can at least inform those kinds of decisions with that there are consequences to behaviors and we know what those are. And again, religion figured this out a long time ago. They know. They can see what happens to communities. That's why those rules are there. Some, something like that. Y yeah. Um, fr from the early part of your talk, it sounded to me like there might have been some influence from uh, Morals by Agreement, uh, Gautier, moral philosopher. I don't know that. Okay. Um, one of his key ideas was that if you rationally chose to adopt moral uh, behavior because of the benefits of cooper cooperating with other people that you gain from that, that um, people can see through that as opposed to someone who internalizes moral principles yeah. and, and sort of makes that a part of their uh, self-concept. And that, um, yeah, I, I take uh, that's exactly what I'm saying, but from a slightly different angle, the, uh, the deception, deception, detection line of reasoning that um, uh, it, it's better to actually believe it yourself. Okay, here's the deal if you believe the lie, 
you're less likely to trigger the characteristics that the lie detector picks up, the increasing blood pressure, sweating, uh, pulse rate, and so on, that lie detectors measure. If, you, if, if it's not a lie for you because you really believe it, well, then your, your, physiolo your physiology won't show that. So, so the, the, the answer is believe the lie. No, the answer is, <laughs> but really, actually, self-deception, there's a whole other study, uh, area of study on self-deception, which is so interesting. It's part of my other, the rest of my work for skeptic stuff, how, how people deceive themselves. I, I actually think most of these psychics and these guys, they probably actually believe what they could do this stuff. I don't think they're all just completely consciously fraudulent and robbing people, you know, I don't think it's like that. I think it's more complex. I think they've come to think, you know, I, maybe I, gosh, all these people are telling me how amazing I am. Maybe I really do have this psychic stuff, you know, and then, then, they, then it gets a feedback loop going in. Deception, self-deception is really pretty powerful. Then you believe it. It's not a lie in that case for, that, for you. Uh, yeah, okay. As a slight deviation, um, in your first book you speak about, in a chapter, about the uh, epidemic of accusation which I thought was extraordinarily interesting. Do you see that forming again in our society with the growing accusations <coughs> towards Catholic priests? Oh, you know, I thought about that. When that first, the Catholic priest business first came out a couple of years ago, I thought, uh-oh, here's that recovered memory business uh, witch hunt. All these people are going to come out of the woodwork. Uh, the Catholic Church is going to be paying out millions of dollars, and lawyers are going to get involved. In fact, that hasn't really happened. What's happened is, is that a lot of these people have confessed, and the church has done investigations and, and uh, found evidence for this stuff. And uh, I think it's turned out to be a different social phenomenon. I'm, I'm, I'm very surprised. I, I really thought it would go the way you just described. Uh, the, I guess it, it's still possible it could. The numbers are so high, I'm just, I'm just shocked. But on the other hand, it's such an abnormal situation for men to be in. And I think there is something to the so social psychology of perhaps people drawn to that particular profession for certain reasons, maybe. I'm, I'm just not sure. It's just a weird thing. It, well, <laughs> uh, it's just the whole situation is so odd to, to make these, I mean, to tell people you can't have sex. It's just so unnatural. Um, anyway, I think it's, it, it, they were setting themselves up for trouble centuries ago when they started that business. Anyway. Okay. Uh, we'll do here and then up here. Yeah. Okay, right. Yeah. You. Uh, there's a huge industry in the United States and uh, Western culture around uh, sports teams and developing rivalries between, between these teams that lots of times are made up of individuals who are not even part of our immediate community, and yet there's this industry set up uh, to uh, encourage rivalries between those, between those things. Is that a reflection of that? Yep. Of that it's just tapping into deep evolutionary emotions right there. It's a perfect example. It's so easy to get in uh, behind your team. Um, I was a huge uh, Dodger fan growing up in L.A. And um, I just completely lost interest when, in the, when the, in the 80s, players began to just swap teams constantly. There was no continuity. It wasn't my team that I could get behind. And then, you know, like a couple of years ago, the old Mally sold the team and all that. It was like... It's just a business. It's not like it's not like my team. So they they were they were losing that tapping into tribalism that worked so well, which you know uh, I guess maybe that's a great outlet instead of you know, religion or politics, sports maybe. Uh, Got to do something with those young guys, <laughs> young men. That's the problem. Uh, uh, stick them in stadiums. <laughs> really, it's it's sort of a joke, but it's kind of true actually. The number one predictor of violence is maleness. <laughs> it is. It's, it's sad to say, <laughs> and I am one, so <laughs> I, I can say that. So. Uh, oh, we had to one more question here. Yeah. Yeah, this is more of a semantic question. Early on, when you were talking about the evolution of, of the uh, moral sentiments, uh, a couple of times you said uh, characteristics were targeted for selection, and I just that struck me because targeting implies somebody's doing the targeting. Oh yeah. It doesn't happen that way. Right. Yeah, you're, you're right. You know, his, his point is that when I use that expression, targeted for selection, the individual or the group, uh, it does sound like a top-down kind of thing. Of course, it's not. It's just the language that evolutionary theorists use. Uh, but even natural selection is not a good term either in that sense. It implies that somebody's doing the selecting, when in fact, the, of course, it's not the case. It just happens, and the only reason <laughs> right. is that it's more successful yeah. than the, than that's the right. alternative. Yeah, that's right. I think that's the problem.
So anyway, uh, if you're interested in uh, the skeptic stuff, again, go to go to skeptic.com, www.skeptic.com. We have. have Michael Shermer is author of In Darwin's Shadow, How We Believe, and The Borderlands of Science. His latest, The Science of Good and Evil, is published by Times Books, an imprint of Henry Holt. For more information, visit henryholt.com and click on the Times Books tab. Created by cable, offered as a public service. You're watching Book TV on C-SPAN 2. Coming up at 12.15 p.m. Eastern, Captors and Captives, the 1704 French and Indian raid on Deerfield. Then Gabriel Schoenfeld on The Return of Anti-Semitism. Tonight on Book TV, Encore Book Notes features Taylor Branch's Pillar of Fire, the second volume in his Martin Luther King trilogy. After that, James Dobson interviews David Limbaugh, author of Persecution, How Liberals Are Waging War Against Christianity. And at midnight Eastern, Reenchantment. Jeffrey Payne documents how Buddhism has spread throughout the Western Hemisphere.